Terrestrial plants and animals need to regulate their internal water by balancing uh, the water they take in against how much water they are losing. Uh, when organisms moved into the terrestrial environment, they basically were uh, looking at potentially losing a lot of water to the environment through evaporation. And then they had uh, reduced access to replacement water compared to when they uh, animals lived in the, the sea or the ocean or the organisms were in the in the sea. Uh, so they have to acquire the capacity to regulate their internal water content on land. So uh, we at this is um, you know, we look at this as in terms of this equation and this would be uh, for an animal and we are looking at uh, how they can regulate their internal uh, water. So, so the I is for internal and the A is for animals. So we're talking about land animals. And obviously we can add water taken in by drinking. We can also add water taken in with our food. So a nice piece of fruit. Uh, in fact, uh, there are some animals that they're like uh, uh, toucans uh, take in most of their water. They don't usually drink water. They are taking it in from their fruit. You can absorb water from the air. And we'll talk a little bit about some examples of animals that do that. And you lose water. So now we're over here on the negatives. Uh, we are going to lose water through evaporation and secretion or excretion. So you could be sweating, you could be crying, you could be oozing, you could be um, uh, urinating. Uh, so there's a number of ways we just uh, dump water out of our body. Uh, so that could be um, uh, reproductive structures, that could be uh, uh, different uh, mucus, we could have uh, feces, lots of different ways we are excreting water. Um, and when we're talking about food, another gain of water with food comes from when we're going through the uh, digestion of the food and then we metabolize it to get the energy out of it. And uh, we can, when we break down the molecules, we actually release water. So uh, if you remember with uh, cellular respiration, and we're taking, we're going to oxidize uh, glucose with C6H12O6, and you, you, uh, you've eaten something that has sugar, you breathe in some oxygen from the air, so the sugar's in your intestine, the air is in your lungs, so the blood goes, picks up the sugar from the intestine, goes to the heart, gets pumped to the lungs, picks up the oxygen, goes to the heart, gets pumped to your brain, where you're gonna need to use that for some energy at this point. And uh, when you break that down, you're gonna get the energy uh, in the form of ATP, and then you have to release, then you have two byproducts. You've got uh, carbon dioxide and water. And this water is metabolic water. So uh, for every molecule of sugar that you break down, you, you can take in six oxygens and you're going to produce um, six carbon dioxide molecules and you're going to produce six water molecules. So you're going to be getting food out through the metabolism of the uh, oxidization of the glucose molecule. Here's an example for the more visual learner of that equation. Uh, here we have a uh, water relations of a terrestrial animal uh, where we can see the uh, acquisition of the water is mainly with food and drinking. 
uh, and the main loss of water from animals is evaporation. But here we also can have water absorbed through the skin and we could have uh, water secreted uh, out through the skin or through urine or different types of secretion. But the main factors here are gonna be evaporation versus eating and drinking your water for most cases. These are some beetles in the uh, Nemed Desert and they don't have any place to drink. They don't have open water sources. There's not gonna be any rain, but what they do have are winds blowing in off the water, um, which have moisture in the air that's picked up from evaporation from the water. And uh, early in the morning when the air is cool enough, remember the air molecules when they're cool, they're going to be closer together. And so the water's gonna condense out of that. Uh, it's gonna be saturated and it's gonna produce fog. When the fog uh, is blown over the, the crest of the dunes, these little guys all line up along the top and they stick their butts up in the air. And uh, what happens is the, the moisture then will condense onto the, the body of the beetle and these little ridges will allow that moisture then, that water to run down uh, to their face and they can drink the little drops of water off the face. Very clever little guys. So the ecologist Paul Cooper uh, actually looked at the bu water budget for this insect, uh, for this little beetle, um, Onimacris, in, this, in the Namib Desert. And he estimated that the rate of water intake by the beetle was uh, close to uh, 50 uh, milligrams of water per gram of body weight per day. And then he could actually break down where uh, this came from. So he was looking at the water gain, most of it. So we see this large uh, blue portion of the graph. Most of the water is coming from that condensed fog. And then we can see uh, the food that they ate had a, contributed a little bit of moisture that, that was in their food. But then the oxidization, that metabolic water, uh, was the uh, also a significant portion uh, from the me metabolism of the sugars and the fats in the food. And we look at the water loss from this guy, we can see that uh, most of it is going to be evaporative water loss uh, with uh, very little loss in the feces and the urine, which were very concentrated so that they didn't lose much that way. So they get most of their food from their water uh, most of their water from their food and uh, from the fog and uh, and then they can uh, conserve it as much as possible but they have to keep this obviously balanced now not all organisms are in the desert are able to take fog water and and use it so uh, kangaroo Rats are also living in the desert. We can look at the water budget for these guys. This is the Miriam's uh, kangaroo rat. And uh, this study was, was uh, basically finding that they're not drinking any water. So all of their water is coming from moisture in the food, which was a very small amount at the top of the graph here. And the majority of it is from that oxidation of the food. So uh, as you're breaking it down, you're getting the water out of the molecules and using it that way. Um, and uh, they lose their water. They have concentrated urine, crystallized urine and feces. So they lose some of their water that way. And then most of their water loss is through evaporation. And so when they are sleeping uh, during the day, they're nocturnal animals. And when they're sleeping down in their burrows during the day, they store their little seeds down there with them. And as they're sleeping, they're going to be breathing out through their nose. They're gonna have water evaporating into the, the den, into the burrow. And the seeds will absorb some of that water so that when they wake up in the evening, uh, they can eat some of that seeds and they get that some of that water right back, right away. Well, animals generally get most of their water by drinking or with their food. Obviously, plants don't drink and, and eat. They get the bulk of their water from the soil through their roots. So when we uh, look at the, the budget for uh, balancing the, 
water regulation in terrestrial plants. We have the internal water content of the plant equals um, the water that it takes in from the roots. And then if it is absorbing anything from the air, and then we're going to lose water through transpiration. So that's the water leaving the leaves, evaporating from the leaves again. And we're going to lose water through secretions. Now, this could be in reproductive structures. It could be going in the fruit. It could be going in nectar. It could be going into the seeds. Um, or you could actually have uh, some sort of uh, secretions or sticky substances around the flowers as well to attract pollinators. So uh, depending on where the environment is, the plant is going to have to uh, regulate that water loss and balance it with the water gain. So visually, then, we're looking at something quite similar to what we had seen, actually, when we looked at regulating temperature. It looks like a very, very similar uh, picture. Um, but here we're, we're not dealing with temperature, we're dealing with water, but these things are clearly tightly linked. So the main avenue of water acquisition for the plants is the water coming into the roots from the soil. Um, but you could have in some environments, like you think of the, the, the insects getting the fog and the desert, there are some plants that will have to absorb water through their leaves that way. And sometimes they will have it condense on and trickle down to the roots. Um, and then we have water loss through uh, transpiration out of the leaves of the plants. And uh, if the plant is trying to stay cool, um, that can actually uh, keep it from overheating. Uh, wind will uh, increase the amount of evaporative water loss and would actually result in the, the plant cooling off faster. Um, and then some plants are going to lose a certain amount of water through uh, their flowers with nectar or, um, or, or fruits or their reproductive structures. Give me what you know then about balancing water uh, and you should be able to answer some questions and come up with some ideas about how plants would respond to droughts and to periods of moisture stress. So when are plants moisture stressed? When do droughts occur? We've talked about uh, drought, drought periods in certain biomes, dry seasons and biomes. We also talked about um, the uh, seasons having uh, the precipitation falling in the form that they can't use it, and that would be when it's frozen in the winter time. Um, and ways that the plants can, when they're starting to dry out, how how are they adapted for it? How how are, do they have certain uh, structures or behaviors and changes that is going to help them conserve the water? And there's a lot of diversity. There's a lot of different strategies. When you think about you are um, losing water through your leaves, then reducing leaves, dropping your leaves in the dry season, curling your leaves up and wilting um, uh, might help you conserve water. Uh, anything that uh, uh, is reducing your temperature should help you conserve water because then you're going to have less uh, evaporation going on. And uh, so there's a whole variety of mechanisms that you could come up with for plants uh, conserving water. and uh, and so why do plants wilt? What, how does that actually help? Well, that's a behavior that's changing the structure of the plant when it's losing water. When it's losing water, the plant leaves will start to wilt. Uh, why does that help? Why does that help them uh, conserve water? So they talk about in this chapter, there was a study um, done on a tropical plant um, that actually lived in the moist tropics. It's an umbrella-shaped plant, uh, Piper oratum, and it grows in the rainforest, but it grows out in the clearings. So uh, in a hot day, it starts to actually get stressed with a water loss in midday, so it starts to dry out. 
Um, so what it does is as it starts to dry out, you lose that water pressure and the leaf starts to collapse. It will start to wilt and it'll start to fold over. And that is going to reduce how much is um, exposed to the sun. That reduces its temperature. So that actually will reduce its rate of transpiration by 30 to 50 percent, which is a, a huge water savings. Um, also, what it does, you can see when the when the leaf is wilting, you can see it starts to fold over. So, so if the leaf was started out as a big, nice flat leaf at the top, as it's wilting, those parts of it will fold over and it starts to make a little uh, shaded spot on the underside that's like a little cave. And as the water is leaving the leaf, it gets trapped in that little cave, which is increasing the uh, water vapor in that area, reducing your uh, gradient, and you're going to lose less water out of the leaf uh, in that underside. Most of the stomata are on the underside of the leaf. The other behavior we find with plants that are living in dry environments is the extent of root development. Um, when they've looked at root systems in different uh, climates, plants in dry climates tend to grow more roots than plants in moist climates. Uh, the roots would grow deeper in the soil um, and the, the ratio of root to, to shoot uh, of the plant is going to increase in a dry climate. Um, in some of the desert shrubs, they can find the, the roots go down uh, 9 meters, even 30 meters into the soil. Very, very deep roots that give them access actually to the groundwater. And uh, you can have like uh, the plant can be you know, nine times bigger uh, underground than it is above ground or 10 times bigger underground than above ground. Um, so if you look at desert plants, most of the growth of the plant is under the ground searching for water because it doesn't have to put out a lot of leaves. There's a lot of sunlight out there for photosynthesis and really it's growing in the direction of what it's limited by and that is going to be water. Um, so it could be 90% of the plant is underground. Whereas if you're looking at a, a boreal forest, a coniferous forest, usually only about 25% of the plant is underground. Um, so it's not necessarily having to search for, for water. So deeper roots help the plants in dry environments extract water from deep within the soil um, profile. So um, I want to talk to a little bit about this uh, study that they put in your textbook that was uh, the one that was done by Park on uh, uh, common Japanese grasses, uh, Digitaria and Elysine indica. And uh, the, the nice thing they do in this book, they just don't tell you the results of things, they tell you how they figured them out. So um, what did they actually do? And you can start to learn something about experimental design by reading reading uh, how they describe these experiments in your textbook. With experimental design, you're going to be testing a hypothesis and you're going to be trying to have controls. And so this is something that was uh, a study that was done in the greenhouse at the Botanical Gardens at the University of, of Tokyo. And uh, what they did was, was they were trying to, to look at the mechanism that allowed one of these grasses, Digitaria, to grow on coastal dunes when Eleusine, another grass, couldn't grow on the coastal dunes. Um, and they were thinking, well, it's probably the responses of the grasses to water stress. The sandy soil on the dunes doesn't hold water as well as, the, as a non-sandy soil because the part of the um, spaces between the sand grains are big and water just washes through. So what Park did uh, was he took the uh, seeds from the botanical gardens and he planted the seeds in, in moist soil. And then he, once this little seedling started to grow, he put them in uh, PVC tubes that were filled with sand from the sand dune. And these were like PVC tubes, like a, like a, a meter tall but with a 10 centimeter diameter. And he put two little seedlings of digitaria in 36 tubes 
and two seedlings of leucine in 36 tubes. So he had 72 tubes and he watered them with a nutrient solution. So they got their, it's like hydroponics, they got their waters and nutrients every 10 days for 40 days. Then at the end of the 40 days, he divided them into two groups. So we had, we had, um, we had 36 tubes of each species, and it was divided into two groups of 18. One group was kept well watered for the next 19 days. The other group, he stopped watering. So half of them he stopped watering so that he could see what happens to them in the drought. And the unwatered digitaria and eleusine responded differently. So we, this is looking at the... Um, sort of the simulated drought. So these are the days after he start, stopped uh, watering them. And you've got pictures of the digitaria uh, and the eleusine. So the eleusine is the blue dots. The digitaria is your, your red dots, so red and, oops, and blue down here. And we can see uh, the uh, amount of root mass that is being produced. So the dependent variable is the root mass dry weight. So they harvested the plants um, and uh, washed the sand off the roots and dried the roots and weighed them. Um, and so they, they took some of them at different times through the experiment. So this is over the, the days since they stopped watering them. And we can see that the longer the experiment went, um, even though both plants continued to grow roots, the digitaria uh, grew a much larger root mass. Um, and it was uh, sevenfold, uh, sevenfold times bigger after 90 days of not watering um, uh, than it had started, whereas the root mass of a leucine was only about three times bigger than it started. Uh, and the digitaria roots were still growing at the end of the experiment, but the leucine uh, really, you know, you can see they were slowing down, they were stopped growing towards the, the end of experiment, the experiment. Um, Park found that the differences in the root growth were greatest in the deeper soil layers. So below 60 centimeters in the tubes, the unwatered uh, eleusine uh, didn't have much growth. Um, or it had suppressed root growth, but digitaria continued to grow deeper. So it's got a bigger mass of roots that go deeper in the soil. This allowed them to, lead, to maintain a higher water potential. Even though they were not being watered, they were getting down into the soil. So uh, we can see that this is the, the days since they were watered across the x-axis and the leaf water potential on the y-axis. So remember, um, zero is the water potential of pure water. So these are more negative than, than pure water. But over the course of the experiment, we can see the water potential in the leaves of the eleusine has gone down, whereas the water potential of the digitaria has stayed fairly stable, has stayed quite flat. Um, so the greater root mass and the deeper roots were able to maintain a higher leaf water potential for the digitaria. So because of this, Park says that the digitaria could be successful in the drier dune habitat because it grows longer roots, which exploits deeper moisture, which keeps its water potential high, um, even if the soils are really dry. A leucine suffers lower water potential and it can't survive as well in the dunes and that's why you don't find it growing in the in the dunes. So um, I think that this is a really uh, interesting study that shows you uh, not only were we looking at the root growth but then they backed it up with looking at the leaf water potential as well. This is a this is a diagram from a study on root growth that was done by um, Couplin and Johnson. And they were looking at the grasslands in Western Canada. So these are temperate grasslands, not tropical grasslands, uh, which have definitely a dry season. And they were looking at the differences in uh, root growth on dry sites versus moist sites. 
And what they did during their study, um, this was a lot of work. Uh, this was done in the 60s. They um, went and they dug out the roots of over 850 plants. So they dug three meters deep into the soil. Um, and then they carefully extracted uh, or sort of traced the roots on, on um, a piece of plexiglass or a piece of paper. And uh, they found that microclimate uh, was affecting the root growth. And this particular example, this is a plant called um, Artemisia frigida. And this is a, so this is a, a forb. And you can see it's gone down 120 centimeters in the soil on the dry sites. But the moist sites, it didn't allocate a lot of energy into root growth. So remember, we talked about how you can't put all uh, equal amount of energy everywhere. You can't be good at everything. So if you're on a moist site, you're not going to put a lot of your energy into growing roots. You're, you're not as concerned about water. You're going to put more of your energy up into growing stems and leaves. So the deeper roots will uh, help them in the dry environments to keep their uh, leaf water potentials higher. So when we look at water um, conservation by plants and animals, uh, there are a lot of similar adaptations. Um, terrestrial organisms tend to be waterproof. We have some sort of coating on the outside. Um, if you're living in a very dry environment, like the kangaroo rat, you could concentrate your urine and your feces. You'll even find that happens to you when you are um, getting dehydrated. There are physiological mechanisms in place to condense the water vapor in your breath so that uh, as it's coming back out your nose, the water vapor can be reabsorbed uh, in the mucous membranes of your nose. And then when you breathe back in, uh, that can be released back into the air as you're breathing in so that you don't have dry air going down into your lungs. Uh, behavioral modifications to avoid stressful times. So if you um, are getting dehydrated, you can go into your little burrow like the kangaroo rat. You can only come out during uh, the nighttime. At the nighttime, the air temperatures are lower. If the air temperatures are lower, that means that the amount of water um, is going to be closer to saturation in the air in the water vapor in the air is going to be closer to being saturated so you're less likely to have more water evaporating off of you um, plants can drop leaves in response to drought. They can drop their leaves uh, in the tropical dry forest during the dry season uh, or in the deciduous forest when we know the water is going to get frozen the leaves are, of the trees drop in the fall. Uh, having thick leaves reduces your surface area for the water to evaporate out. Having fewer stomata, so fewer places for the water to escape. And going into a dormant period. So going into a summer estivation period, you find your lawn does that. Uh, in the summer drought, it might turn brown and it's just going into a period of dormancy. It's not dead. And as soon as it rains again, it'll pop back green and uh, thrive again. Just going through a few examples then of uh, different water loss in different environments. Um, here we have a, a pond turtle, which lives in a very wet habitat. Um, and uh, a box turtle, which is usually found um, away from the ponds. It's in a drier habitat. And the desert tortoise, uh, which is in the driest habitats. So we're going from a species found in wet habitats to dry habitats. And, then, and the, and the y-axis is your uh, water loss. And in this case, it is in micrograms per square centimeter of surface area per hour. So it is um, moderated by the size of these turtles. And as you can see, uh, when we look at the water loss, the water loss is highest in the turtles that uh, really are not concerned about replacing the water. They can still keep their water balance uh, uh, the way that it needs to be. So those would be the, the, the pond turtles. 
and the water loss is going to be lowest and it's conserved more the water in the desert tortoises. So we can see the, the ones that have uh, the uh, more constraints on being able to replace the water are losing the least amount of water. So they're able to balance their water budget. This is looking at uh, two species of tiger beetles. Um, and so the uh, the tiger beetle that is living beside the stream versus the tiger beetle, beetle that's living in the desert grassland. Um, once again, this is their water loss in micrograms per square centimeter of surface area per hour. And the stream side one um, has a moist habitat. It loses water at a much higher rate compared to the one living in the dry habitat. When they looked at these tiger beetles to figure out how does the uh, desert beetle avoid losing water, they find that its uh, cuticle, so its, its outer layer of skin, is uh, basically contains uh, more hydrocarbons, so it's actually coating itself with a, a layer of a, a waxy substance that prevents it from losing water. Uh, the uh, hydrocarbons, they're, they're sort of um, uh, like a waterproof layer on the cuticle on the outside of the of the beetles. Uh, looking at Miriam's kangaroo rats again, um, they conserve water so efficiently that they don't ever have to uh, drink water. They get it from their food, and we talked about the metabolic water, and this is assumed to be an adaptation to living in the deserts. Um, over long periods of time, American Southwest has become more arid, and so in the past, the ancestors were probably subject to natural selection. The ones that had the adaptations were the ones that were able to survive. Now, Marion's, Miriam's kangaroo rat is a widespread species. It lives from um, uh, Mexico to uh, Nevada. And so over this geographic area, the rat kangaroo rat populations are exposed to a broad range of environmental conditions. So uh, they were looking to see, uh, did they adjust their uh, evaporative water loss depending on their uh, dry, the conditions that they were living in? And they did indeed find that the evaporative water loss, once again, uh, micrograms of water uh, per, per gram, this is per body weight per hour, um, the kangaroo rats in the dry areas uh, were actually losing less water than the ones uh, found in the moist areas. So the um, they, were, they were in slightly different uh, habitats, and you could actually see that there were clear differences between the populations. Um, in these uh, driest sites, this is basically a sand dune area with a few shrubs, and then the intermediate sites were sort of a scrubby uh, desert scrub, shrub land, and then uh, the pinyon juniper woodland is the moist, moister site with a lot more um, shade, so it's a much less uh, concern about water loss. Um, so they found that the uh, that they even when they brought the kangaroo rats into the lab, uh, they did not acclimate to the lab conditions. So they didn't change their water uh, conservation uh, based on where they are. They're not um, it wasn't eliminating differences uh, from when you brought them had them living out in a dry place, but these populations actually were selected to have more um, individuals that were able to reduce their water loss in the in the sand dune habitat uh, than compared to the populations that were more adapted to the um, pinyon pine habitat. This is a great picture in your book. Here we have a dromedary ca camel from Southwest Asia, Northern Africa, and a cigar cactus from uh, Southwestern US. Very different organisms, completely unrelated, both living in deserts though, and they have come up with uh, strategies to deal with living in such a dry environment and uh, similar approaches to water conservation. And you look at the, the the camel and it can store fat in its hump uh, so when it is uh, when it finds water it'll drink and drink and drink it can drink up to like a third of its body weight in water um, 
put that into the fat in its hump and then when it dries out um, when it's been without water for a long time it can go for for losing like 20 percent of its body weight uh, because it can it can metabolize it uses the metabolic water by metabolizing this fat when it needs more water um, it's going to reduce its, its heat gain by uh, facing the sun so it's not the broad side of the camel against the sun but just the, the skinny side that way it's not going to heat up too much and it's going to have dense hair to reduce heating up and that way it's going to reduce evaporative loss uh, it doesn't sweat can withstand its body temperature rising uh, up up to seven degrees Celsius. That's like uh, what 15 degrees Fahrenheit increase in temp body temperature. We can't do that. We can't do it with all that water loss. We can't do with all that heat gain. Um, but the the camel can. The cactus it is reducing its water loss by not having any leaves. Uh, they've modified it into little spikes that are going to protect it from things trying to eat it. Uh, it's going to um, reduce the, the heat gain by only having uh, minimum branches and leaves that are going to be exposed to the sun and causing more evaporation. Uh, and then when it does rain, it is going to uh, swell up. And uh, the next slide has a video on it of it swelling up that you could stop the pause it next slide and take a look at that. And uh, drink and drink and drink when it does rain and then it can live off of that uh, water stored in its big uh, trunk and branches and uh, we will talk about uh, photosynthesis uh, in the next lecture in these cacti but they reduce their water loss by keeping their stomata uh, closed during the day and they'll open their stomata at night and that way they can get the carbon dioxide in that they need for cellular or for photosynthesis um, and the water will escape at night when the air is cooler and there's less uh, place in the air for uh, the moisture to go so it's a reduced uh, uh, pre pressure uh, gradient, uh, vapor pressure gradient so it's not going to lose as much water at night. So uh, I suggest stopping um, and watching this uh, segment from uh, video on uh, looking at the the rain in the desert uh, from planet Earth and seeing the, the you can watch the trunk of the cactus swell up in that in that video. So you can click on the link, pause this, go to YouTube. Now we have really talked about uh, balancing the water when you don't have enough water. There are cases where you have too much water. So what problems are caused by too much water? What adaptations do plants have for flooding? Have you ever overwatered over your plants? So when you've got too much water, are you going to be flooding the roots? Are, and the roots are not doing photosynthesis. They are not producing oxygen in the roots. They're just doing cellular respiration. They need oxygen. Are you drowning the roots? Are you killing the roots of the plant? Another thing to consider, um, and they briefly mention in the chapter, is uh, salinity. How does salt affect the water in a plant? You think about uh, plants on ocean beaches, uh, you've got that salt spray and you've got high salt content in the soil. How is the water still going to get from the soil into the plant? Remember, you need to have uh, a gradient. And if you've got so much salt in the soil, is the water going to be a higher uh, pressure in the plant and leave the plant and go into the soil how do you make sure that you get the water going the right way so think about the being to these questions you're going through um, review the concept of water availability how much water is in the air how it moves between the soils and the plants think about water reg regulation on land how water is acquired by animals and plants how it's conserved to those um, make sure you can answer the concept review questions in 6.1 and 6.2. I did not cover 6.3. Uh, and uh, so these are the particular concept review questions I think you should be able to answer. The chapter review questions 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 7. Also, 
take a look at investigating the evidence number six. Um, it's on sample size. It's in Appendix A and be able to answer the first couple of questions. Remember, we talked about that uh, detailed experiment with the two uh, grasses, the Eleusine and the uh, Digitalis, Digitaria, and, uh, and, and the sample sizes they use for the experiment. And think about how much variation there is in populations and why do we need large sample sizes in ecology. As you're reading, uh, our next presentation is going to be on Chapter 7. Uh, which is uh, on energy and nutrient relations. So we've talked about the impact of temperature. We've talked about the impact of water. Now we're going to talk about energy. See you then.